Welcome to my video. In 1999 and through to 2000, I was fortunate enough to own an acre of land in Crystal Waters Eco Village, which is located in the hinterland behind the Sunshine Coast in Australia. This is a beautiful 640 acre property which is jointly owned by people living in 55 houses. Each house has a dedicated one acre of land privately owned. The remainder of the property is owned in common. It was a former cattle property on cleared land that was revitalised and revegetated and became a wildlife sanctuary over several decades through the 1990s and 2000s. It is a very beautiful place. There is a lot of wildlife. You can see in the video now there are some eastern grey kangaroos. There's a quite a large number of animals that live in the wild on the property. They're still wild but they're tolerant of people and don't run away as soon as they see us. They're very wary. They'll look at you, see what you're doing. As soon as they realise you're not a threat, they calm down and pretty much ignore you. Uh, the eastern grey kangaroo is basically the uh, deer of Australia. This is one of the houses nearby to my block of land in Crystal Waters. It's a two-storey timber house. There's another one. And you can see they're all nestled in amongst the trees that are regrowing. All the trees planted on the property are less than 15 years old. That's looking across to a neighbouring property which is still largely uh, denuded for cattle grazing. The eastern grey kangaroos are, are basically very um, prolific and they come right up to the lawns around the houses. If you leave the door open they're inquisitive enough to even go inside occasionally. This one is a female. You can see she's got a bulging pouch which has a young joey inside it. The joey's probably asleep because you can't see the head poking out. The mother is able to retract the pouch opening so that it's quite a small opening which keeps the animal inside from falling out when she hops along. Uh, the kangaroos are pretty inquisitive. They'll look at everything you're doing. Um, if you plant seedlings unfortunately they will nibble on them so there is a need to put fences around any vegetable patches, especially with seedlings and young delicious plants. Uh, the kangaroos predominantly eat grass, but they will also obviously eat other plants to their liking. Fortunately, they don't tend to chew on uh, vine barks and that, so if you grow grapes or a similar vine, they'll be fine, they won't get, won't get, won't get destroyed. So, the kangaroos of crystal waters. Um, it's a unique experience for people who come to visit the property because often they've never seen kangaroos close up before and this is a great way for people to see them. There's a young joey in the pouch and that's looking across to some neighbouring properties. One of the roads, there are seven kilometres of sealed roads around Crystal Waters and there's a process of largely revegetating the property. A lot of dams have been established all around the property and they're used for pumping water out for uh, firefighting if there's a necessity for that, but also for use in uh, irrigating uh, any crops that you might want to grow on your land. There's a fully reticulated system throughout the property, so every house has access to reticulated dam water for use outside, as well as any rainwater they may harvest from the roof. Here you can see a lot of the regrowth trees that have been planted and some of the houses in one of the clusters. There are seven kilometres of sealed roads within the property and the houses have been arranged in clusters. Uh, the roads are all private and the speed limit is 40 kilometres an hour. Pedestrians and animals have right of way. Um, most of the landowners have built the houses close to the roads. Uh, this is the common uh, building called the kitchen which has a commercial level uh, kitchen facility and dining area and it's where community meals are prepared. There's a large playground area as well. Crystal Waters in 1995 was awarded a World Habitat Award by the United Nations. 
and that's uh, the fire shed. Uh, there's a rural fire brigade with two uh, Jeep fire engines in case of fire. The area is predominantly dry sclerophyll rainforest and this means it is prone to fire so we're very wary of that on the property. There's an abundance of bird life which has been attracted by the revegetation. This is a pale-headed rosella. And there's a few ring-in foreign animals living on the property. These are alpacas, uh, which are shorn for their wool, and they just graze the grass like, much like the kangaroos do. They're quite cantankerous, those pair, and uh, are not um, opposed to nipping on you if you try to get too close to them. This is July 1999 now, and here are some king parrots enjoying ripening bananas. There's a constant, obviously, tussle between uh, food that's taken by the wildlife, which is attracted by the property being revegetated, and the food that is uh, grown by the residents to be eaten. So there's a largely happy arrangement where enough is grown so that there's a surplus for the wild animals to, to enjoy as well. Uh, king parrots are beautiful parrots. The males are the ones with the red head. The females are the ones that are all green. This female probably has both of these males vying for her attention for mating, which is why they're hanging around her. Crystal Waters is situated in a subtropical area of Queensland, Australia, and it is able to grow things like bananas, pawpaws and other tropical fruits, but also you can grow things like citrus, even apples. Uh, in the winter, because it's, the houses are all built in the valley areas, it can get quite cold with uh, frost sumps, and the coldest weather I recorded when I lived there was minus eight degrees centigrade or Celsius. Uh, so that's quite cool. In summer, it can get up to 35 degrees sometimes, maybe a bit hotter, uh, but it's an ideal climate for growing all kinds of food, which is one of the benefits of living there. And as you can see here, the king parrots are enjoying these bananas. It is possible to bag the bananas with plastic bags to prevent the birds getting at them and some people do that to ensure they have some left over for themselves. And the king parrots are very beautiful animals. I shot this video before I built my house. I was just staying in a neighbouring house while awaiting the time for the builders to turn up and I did this videoing of the, of the area just uh, as a keepsake of, to remind me of what it was like to live there. Um, I had intended to live there for longer than I ended up doing so but it is a fairly isolated property in that it's 27 kilometres along narrow winding country roads to the nearest small town with a supermarket. This is a butcher bird. It's a black and white uh, Australian native bird. It has a beautiful melodious song when it, when it decides to sing. And they are mainly grub eating, uh, insectivorous sort of birds. Uh, they'll also eat uh, small animals that they can catch or carry in from other larger animals. There's an eastern grey kangaroo hopping along. It's a very unique method of motion for animals this large. There are smaller hopping mice and that in other continents and other parts of the world, but Australia is unique in having these large deer and elk sized animals that hop along on their back legs. This is one of the common meadow lands down by the creek line. Uh, it, this particular one is not being utilised, but it's able to be either grazed or farmed by the locals should we so wish to do so. But at the time I filmed this, it wasn't being used. Um, all the flat arable land obviously has been left tree free for the purpose of being used for agriculture. 
This is uh, Kilcoy Creek, which is right adjacent to the one acre property I purchased. It's a lovely little stony uh, brook, not very large. Most of the, in fact, it dries out at certain times. But after a lot of heavy rain, there's a raging torrent coming down that creek. Um, it is the boundary of the property. Across the other side of the creek is uh, other farmland. This shows the creek after a lot of rain. You can see the water level is much higher. Uh, the water is a bit turbid because of the, the runoff from the farmland. Kilcoy Creek flows into the Mary River, which is the largest uh, river. And in fact, the Mary River carved out this whole valley region over millions of years, and it flows through into the Coral Sea. So this is my one acre property after it's been slashed. And um, you can see it's a sloping hillside. So it's not flat land. None of the really flat land was set aside for houses. That was all reserved to be used for agricultural purposes. That's one of the boundary marker pegs for my property. And looking up, um, that's the long one boundary of my land looking along. All of the trees you can see here were planted by the neighbour who used to own the block that I purchased. So all of those trees are about 12 to 14 years old. In order to build my house, I was required to clear some of those trees, unfortunately, but I certainly planted a lot more later on to make up for it. And the trees that were cut down were all utilised for uh, timber for my wood heater in subsequent winters. That is the boundary track alongside my property. So my property is to the left of that, of that uh, track. This is now looking up into my neighbour's property and she's done a lot of uh, treeing up. That's her carport there. And then that's the end of the, the local road, uh, which joins up to the rest of the sealed roads. That's the water pipe for the reticulated water system, the electricity box, and the junction of the uh, mains electricity. So all ready to go for when the house gets constructed. So looking down the neighbouring track, that's an access track which is used by four-wheel drive vehicles to get access to the, to the uh, flat. Occasionally that is slashed. There's a red-necked wallaby, which is another of the little hopping creatures that lives in the property in quite large numbers. So that's looking across just below where the house was going to be constructed now. This is filmed from where the house will be constructed, giving the northerly aspect from the big veranda. That'll be the view the house will have. And this is now panning right across the site where the house is to be constructed. And some of these trees had to be chopped down for the house. That's another boundary marker for the property. All up it's one acre of land, which is about um, four thousand three hundred square meters, I think, from memory. And that's looking across the common land below my property again. So this is from the base of the common land looking back up the hill uh, towards my land. That grassland is not native Australian plants, that's all imported uh, grass species used by farmers. Uh, a lot of it's kaikuya grass, which comes from southern Africa. Uh, if it's unchecked and there's good rainfall, that can grow six or seven feet high. Along the creek edge, you can see lantana, another invasive South American species. And once I had the house built, I went through and got cleared all that out, got rid of it. I was only interested in planting native vegetation that was endemic to the local region. And this is looking across uh, the trees on the property. As I said earlier, they're all 12 to 15 years old. 
So there's quite a good growth rate of trees in this area. A lot of these are eucalypt trees, which are actually hardwood. This is now January and May 2000. This is the summer and uh, autumn in Australia. This shows the property immediately before the clearing was done. Those birds are Australian magpies. They're the, the largest sort of insectivorous and small animal catching birds in, in the area. This is the area where the house is going to be constructed. It's uh, been mown and the trees have been cut down that were going to be removed. So you can see some tree stumps there. That fire was where some of the smaller branches and stumps were burnt. Uh, not the stumps, sorry, they haven't been pulled out yet, but the smaller branches were burnt um, just to, because there was too many to, to mulch them down. But all the trunks and larger branches were retained to be chopped up to use as firewood. January 2000, this is site preparation now. There's a small excavator on the property and he's been going through pulling out all the tree stumps on the land uh, to ensure that they're out of the way for the foundation work to come later. This was a Cabelco machine with a little blade you can see there to push things along and an arm with a, an excavator bucket on it. And what he's doing here is using the hydraulics to leverage the roots and break the roots to be able to pull the stumps of the trees out. So this is after the stumps have been removed and what he's doing now is doing a bit of levelling, cut and filling and preparing the areas where the foundations are going to be dug. Now I've built a house that was partially rammed earth and partially timber on stumps. Um, rammed earth houses usually tend to be built on fairly flat ground they require quite deep foundations and building them on a, an appreciable slope presents difficulties in that there's a considerable amount of uh, excavation work needed to ensure very stable foundations. Rammed earth walls are very heavy and they require far better foundations than a typical house would, would require. It's now February 2000, towards the end of the Australian summer. The access driveway has been uh, bulldozed through and uh, material laid, so the site can be accessible. The pad has now been fully prepared. So because I've got a gently sloping hillside here, I required quite deep foundations for the rammed earth walls to sit upon. You can see there there are regular uh, hole, post holes which will be uh, filled with concrete that's reinforced with iron bars um, and there are also foundation trenches all around the edges of the slabs and wherever rammed earth walls are going to be built. In all on my property I had $10,000 worth of underground foundation work done. The entire house cost was $143,000. So you can see there that the underground foundations were about 8% of the total build cost for the house because it was rammed earth walls and there was a sloping block. This is looking down from the driveway towards the uh, prepared uh, area for the foundations. And you can see there some of the uh, the rebar and the uh, mesh is ready to go and you can also see they've done the trench in for electricity and the reticulated water will also go through the same trench. This is a passion fruit vine which is growing wild on one of the trees near my house site. Again, looking across a pan of the foundations, everything ready to go, awaiting the concreting, which would happen the following day. I made use of some of the fallen trees to create this fire circle with some hardwood benches to sit upon. 
and that's in an area away from the house surrounded by young trees. This is an epiphyte, a uh, fern that grows out of a tree. And this, once again, is the beautiful Kilcoy Creek. You can see now the water level is lower than it was in the previous bit of video. Uh, most of the air display is beautifully clear, but the water is very cold. Um, so if you want to go for a lie down and cool off, it, it's a bracing experience. It's really nice having this creek right in my house. And it's only perhaps 40 metres away from the house. And this is looking from lower down the hill back towards the area where the foundation work's been done. Okay, the concrete truck has just left and all of the uh, post holes and the base underground foundations are now completed. Uh, this is the below ground uh, foundation work. You can see there are a lot of uh, reinforcing iron rods. They will be in the base of the rammed earth walls and help to marry the rammed earth to the foundations. Of course, on top of this, the slab itself will be laid. Now those blocks are there for a retaining wall, which is required at the lower end of the rammed earth portion of the house because below that the natural hillside will be used for the timber part of the house. And here is one of the retaining walls. It's made of uh, concrete blocks which are, have been concrete filled. So it's a fairly solid wall. Um, it's obviously got reinforcing blocks as well and that w has been designed to meet the lo loading required to retain that slope. That's some of the uh, holes and uh, posts that are going to be used for the timber part of the house. Okay, it's now February, a few days later, and the slab is being poured. The formwork has been prepared and the mesh has been laid uh, for the slab. There's also termy mesh gone in for termite protection and plastic sheeting, which they always put in under the slab. So that's quite a large area of slab which is going to be poured. All up it's about 90 square metres of uh, slab for half of the house. That's the electricity box. <coughs> and here you can see the guys are in the process of uh, laying the last bit of the slab. Um, it was truck after truck after truck of concrete came from uh, one of the local concrete plants at Conondale which is not that far away. It's about, um, I think, 15 or 20 kilometres away to the concrete plant, so there wasn't too big a drive. Uh, you can see here that the truck's driven and backed right up to the site, and the concrete's been uh, just slewed straight into the slab, and it's been manually uh, uh, shoveled into place. This is a, a pneumatic uh, vibrator, which is used to vibrate the concrete and settle it and get the air bubbles out and ensure that it's a very compact and uh, dense concrete slab without any um, possibility of gaps where it might crack later on. And of course the top surface of the slab is smoothed over and leveled. These guys were pretty skilled at their work. I watched them do the whole job and uh, it was no nonsense. They got on with it and they had it done in pretty well quick time. You can see there the posts for the timber part of the house have also been all completed and here now the slab is fully finished and the formwork's been removed and the slab is now drying and curing and there was a bit of a gap until the rammed earth could be done to ensure those walls were completely dry and could take the loading for the weight of the rammed earth walls. Now you can see there there's a few corner pegs around jutting out of the slab for the rammed earth, but majority of the rammed earth is going to sit on top of the slab. And these are all the posts at the uh, timber side of the house at the base of the slope. So I, in hindsight, I desperately wish I had built the entire house in rammed earth and done it split level down the slope perhaps in three separate 
levels in three separate individual buildings. But unfortunately, um, hindsight is wonderful and I didn't have that experience at the time. You can see there the timber floor has been put in um, at the same level as the slab, so the entire house is all on one level. This provided an underhouse storage area, which was useful, but it would have been a much nicer dwelling had the entire house been made with rammed earth walls. It is now March 2000, which is the middle of autumn in Queensland, so it's a bit cooler but it's still dry. And this is the material being delivered that will make up the rammed earth walls. Now, I could not use any of my soil on my site because the soil where I was so close to the Kilcoy Creek and in the bottom of a valley, a river valley, it was very loamy and clayey. It was the wrong sort of soil to be used to create rammed earth walls. Uh, rammed earth walls are mainly constructed out of decomposed rock subsoil. In this case, it's decomposed pink sandstone and granite. Uh, so it's got a pinkish sort of hue to it. Um, this material had to be sourced from a considerable distance from my house which was unavoidable in, in this case. Um, of course, where possible, it's really nice to be able to make use of local soil to avoid the, the mileage and the freight costs associated with bringing soil in from a remote location. Here, the Bobcat, being capably driven by a guy called Garbo Farkas, is, uh, he's smoothing the ground, ready to start mixing some rammed earth. And what he then would do is drive the bobcat over, grab a scoop of the decomposed subsoil, scatter it on the ground over a fairly wide area. He would then uh, put layers of uh, comp bags of cement into it and then more decomposed granite and mix it up as he went along. Here you can see the formwork is being put up this is custom specially designed for rammed earth walls and you can see what they do is it's steel formwork with a timber facing on it, very smooth uh, timber. They use some sort of veneered uh, plywood type material with a very smooth top surface. The uh, formwork is spaced at the exact width they want the walls to be. The rammed earth mix that the bobcat has mixed up is then hand shoveled into the formwork and compressed air operated pneumatic rammers then hand ram the earth and compact it. This compaction generates a very dense material that at the time it's actually put in and compacted is damp. It contains 10% cement and the rest of it is decomposed uh, stone. The, the action of the, the ramming makes it almost as hard as natural stone, uh, certainly harder than sandstone. You cannot scratch it with your fingernail when it's set. So it's harder than sandstone but clearly not as hard as something like granite or, or a uh, metamorphic rock. It's um, probably as hard as the hardest uh, sedimentary rocks. It's a very stable, sturdy building material, extremely good insulator and fireproof. So good for a country where it's fire prone. If the full heat of the day's sun will not penetrate that wall, so it's extremely good in a hot climate to keep the house cool. And conversely, in the winter, if you heat the house inside, it will keep the house lovely and warm as well. You can see there the mix is being sprayed to try and keep a consistent level of moisture in, inside it. This is um, done by just experience of the workers involved. They know how damp to make it and they know how to mix it up and uh, get it the right consistency to be able to move around. You can see there a platform. Once the wall gets to a certain height, the bobcat will dump the material onto a raised platform. This is so it can be easily shoveled into wherever the height of the walls is up to. Now here you can see the bobcat is mixing up a different colour of rammed earth. I, in this house, decided to build a 
feature wall of different hues of earth to create sort of a, an artificial strata look like you can see in some layered um, sandstones and, and, and rocks. This uh, was the first time this builder had ever seen this sort of work undertaken or given it a try himself. So he was new to it as well as I was and we just did the best we could. It's a bit of a hit or miss process because you can't see the wall as you're building it. You can only view it from the top down and guesstimate what the layers are looking like. So it was very much a trial and error thing. So I started off with a lighter layer, then a darker reddish layer, then a brown layer, and made sort of smooth, curvy contours between the different materials, um, which was just a novel, different thing to achieve an interesting, unique look for one of the walls. Um, doing this layering was also much more expensive because it meant they could only do one little wall at a time. And it also meant because of the different materials, different batches were mixed at different times, it, it ended up being over twice as expensive per square meter to do this multicolored wall as the rest of the house cost. So bear that in mind if you want to do one or do the whole house that way, it is more expensive, but the looks can be quite stunning. You can see there, that's the, the lighter coloured grey, that's the cement powder which has been mixed in. And all the mixing here was done by Bobcat. You can see there the sections of the formwork are held in place by clamps, G-clamps. Um, mine was, a, I think, about the 25th house this builder had constructed, so he was quite adept at around built by that time. There's the compressor uh, which created the, the air air for the compressors to work, pneumatic hammers, and there they are compressing and hammering down the, the rammed earth material. It's very labour intensive work. At uh, the height of the, the construction I think I had something like eight or ten workers on site. Um, less on this day because they were doing that feature wall which um, only required three or four workers on site. But once they got into the full swing of the round earth, then it was um, all, all hands to the pump, so to speak. Here you can see they're adding an additional uh, layer of formwork to enable them to progress the height of the wall. And they do this as they go because obviously the pneumatic rammers can't reach down far enough to put too much formwork in at any given time. So it's done in little sections and there he is hand shoveling in the mix and as they're, they're um, raking at level and then you have it from memory and at the same time the bobcat's mixing up more of the material and putting it on the platform ready for shoveling in into the formula. Now one of the beauties of this is that the actual job of shoveling is uh, low skill so if you are the house owner and you are capable of uh, doing the work, there is no reason why you could not uh, be involved in the labouring yourself and do the shoveling component, if not the pneumatic hammering, um, as long as you're supervised with someone who knows what they're doing. Now here they're removing the formwork from the feature wall with the different layered strata in the wavy uh, lines. And you can see there the waves of the different material colour. You can see there there are holes through the formwork um, where the rammed earth was put in. This was where the spaces were fitted and also where the, the rods that tied and held the formwork in place were there because once the ramming is done, obviously the formwork would just splay apart and fall off if it wasn't held in place by a screw thread bolt all the way through and screwed at both extremities. Um, this means that the wall will have a hole through it wherever one of those rods was. So when those rods are removed, they are hand plugged uh, rammed earth is pushed into the holes, rammed in with a bit of doweling rod or broom handle, and the holes are filled in. That doesn't affect the structural integrity, of course. So here's the final uh, formwork being removed, and you can clearly see the uh, feature uh, strata layers. Now, 
With Graham Dirk, you've got two choices. You can either leave the uh, smooth surface created by the formwork in place, and some people choose to do this for a smoother logging wall, or while the rammed earth mix is still wet and damp, wire brushes can be used to scrape away some of the surface, which creates a, a rougher, more coarse texture in the rammed earth walls. I lot, quite like this rougher look, so I opted and elected for this to be done. Once again, this is a fairly unskilled bit of work which the owner could do himself. Uh, it's obviously labour intensive, you know, two people being employed to do that for quite a few hours each each um, day to get well, not that long in this case because it's a small wall but when the major walls get constructed all around uh, the wire brushing took a considerable amount of time each afternoon after the formwork was removed so that first bit of rammed earth wall is complete and just to do that little bit of wall with those four guys took um, basically the best part of one day. So that gives you an idea of the labour involved. Four man days for that much wall. Okay, this is a few days later and you can see they've erected a few more walls um, and they're busy doing another one. This is my feature wall uh, done in two sections and you can see there it's uh, quite a striking looking feature. Um, this is an alcove which um, I had a couple built in the house. As the um, rammed earth is being put in and when the formwork sections are put in, there's a possibility to insert into the walls on the inside surfaces of the wall little uh, bits of uh, shaped formwork which will not be rammed. It'll be a little sort of bubble of uh, mist space and that when the rammed earth wall is completed will form a little indent or alcove. Uh, other people put in semi-precious stones, ceramic, all kinds of things into the wall against the inner surface of the formwork so that the ramming will hold that in place when, when the ramming is completed. You can see there there's four guys up on the wall. This is um, smoothing off the very top sections of the wall so that they're level. They've got to be precisely flat and level so that obviously the uh, beams and trusses for the roof can be put immediately on top of the round walls. This shows some of the clamps that hold the round of um, formwork in place and brace it against each other. And this is one of the end pieces of the formwork which is held in place with wooden chocks and uh, tie rods. And this is one of the walls being constructed. And basically each time you put a shovel load in and spread it, you ram it in place. So it's just a process of ramming, ramming, ramming. And that's sort of rammed as much as you can. You can tell by looking when the surface is fully compacted. It gets a sort of a sheen on it. The guy at the top who's throwing this, the soil in just does it a few inches at a time and then it's rammed and he throws in a few more inches. So on one side they're removing some of the formwork whilst on the other walls on the far side of the house they're continuing to do the ramming and create another section of the wall. This is interesting, this is one of the corners where windows are going to be situated. So the windows are spaced at the, the exact height of one of the levels of formwork which the formwork heights are a precise number of centimetres I can't remember now but it matched typical Australian uh, building heights for windows and ceilings and, and that sort of thing so this corner where two windows are going to be they have to smooth the, the surface of the top of the rammed earth and then continue ramming the adjacent section you can see here the formworks being removed and the walls being uh, sanded down as they go. And the ramming's finished for the day now and all the formwork is being removed. The formwork is not really left in place after the ramming finishes because the act of ramming solidifies the wall. 
sufficiently and as soon as the formwork's removed, the sooner the wall is able to start drying out. This is the removal of one of the plugs of uh, uh, material that was put in there to create an alcove. That was a custom design little uh, nook or cranny, whatever you want to call it, alcove. And it's a little arch nook, similar to what you see in uh, medieval abbeys and uh, that sort of thing. And that's, you can put ornaments in there, candles, something like that. You can see it's chiselled to give it a nice finish and then hand smooth with a bit of uh, wet ramming mix to achieve a nice finish. And that can just be tapped with a rubber mallet to uh, firm it up and uh, it'll dry off quite nicely. And then it's wire brushed to match the rest of the wall. So it's quite a nice result in the end. Um, and I call that alcove. And again, the builder hadn't really done a lot of those and um, he was able to take that particular mould away with him to use on other properties. This is a real close-up of the rammed earth showing what it looks like. It wasn't there for long, unfortunately. But it's a beautiful blend of all kinds of little aggregate stone and very pleasing look too. It's sort of got a honey-coloured appearance. And that's due to being decomposed sandstones. You can see there the walls are drying out. Several months later now, and the rammed earth is completely finished and dry, and the timber framing of the house is now well underway. The uh, first bits of uh, roof trusses are being put up. Uh, I didn't really film this section with video, but there's some photographs to show the process. That's the completed roof uh, timberwork ready to go for the uh, roofing iron to go on. There's a fair bit of timber in that. The entire roof area is 220 square metres of roof. That's a 20,000 litre rainwater tank ready to be situated. Okay, the roof has now been installed. And in Australia, most modern houses these days have a colour bond corrugated iron roof which has got a baked on paint that's created in the factory. Uh, it's a very hardy, robust, long lasting roof finish, which is not prone to corrosion. Uh, a light coloured roof reflects the heat. This is the interior um, uh, wall chip rock we put in, uh, drywall, I think it's called in America. And you can see there that some of the windows have been installed, sliding doors. The gutters have been finished, so that roof is now fully uh, uh, rain tight, and inside of the house can be constructed out of the out of the elements. This is later on now, and the exterior hardwood cladding has been put on the um, tim tim timber side of the house. This um, material is uh, Western Red Cedar, which is wood imported from Canada, from plantations in Canada. Um, I chose to have it oiled rather than painted. Okay, it's now the end of autumn and the interior of the house is being fit fitted out. You can see there the roof plastering and the wall plastering is finished, ready for painting. Now in the rammed earth walls here you'll notice that conduits were built into the walls when the house was being constructed. With rammed earth, this is extremely important. You've got to plan ahead and design all of your conduits and plumbing pipes and electricals, power points, light switches, uh, faucet points for taps, everything well in advance so that all that can be put into situ as the concrete uh, rammed earth walls are constructed. A similar way you've got to do the same thing in a slab before the slab's poured. This is just a quick walk around of the house now so you can see all the fixtures and fittings in the walls where they protrude. This is one of the bedrooms and you can see there the feature rammed earth wall. 
that's the linen cupboards with the doors put on and that's looking through to another bedroom and another bedroom yet again so this house that I built had three bedrooms it's a fairly modest house by Australian standards um, but it was a traditional design all built into one building on one level and in hindsight I dearly wish I had built the house in three pavilions all in rammed earth and in different split levels down the slope would have been a far better outcome that's all the tiles ready for construction and laying later on for the bathrooms and the living room floor and this is looking out onto the deck which has an arched uh, timber clad ceiling and has a lovely view to the north over the property and across to the hills beautiful rural outlook you can hear the stream bubbling away from there it really was a beautiful location for a house this is some photographs now, that's the rammed earth kitchen area and this is looking across from the outside of the house across all the rammed earth walls that's the deck area and that's the rammed earth walls for the living area and kitchen all the windows are now in place June 2000 now, it's winter and the interior fit out of the house is nearing completion this is looking from the bottom of my acre property up across the land to the house you can see there now the timber site has been coated with oil the uh, trenches have all been put in for the uh, water treatment system the railing has been put in for the deck and the paved areas for the patio and that are all sort of ready to go one of the local eastern grey kangaroos again as much as some of the weeds that have grown up in my mounds of topsoil this is after the topsoil has been spread now you have to be very careful here you see that brown coloured land near the house that's left over decomposed granite from the rammed earth work now rammed earth is not very good for growing plants on so it's pretty important that you don't have it lying on the ground where you want to grow lawns or, or trees or shrubs or garden beds because you won't grow much in rammed earth mix so it's best to relocate any rammed earth leftover mix to be underneath sheds underneath carports underneath paved areas or pathways where it is ideal that's the um, carport area where the slab there has been coated with a colour an ochre colour you can see the retaining wall there some of the local magpie birds and that's the deck which has just recently been oiled it's hardwood timber the floor there's all terracotta tiles and they're just in the process of installing the uh, kitchen there's the cabinetry for the kitchen it's all timber topped cork tile floor on the uh, kitchen and you can see there you can put tiles directly onto the rammed earth walls this is the timber end of the house, that's the hallway this is after the paintings underway you can see there the toilet and bathroom There's the alcove which I had installed in the rammed earth. There's the, uh, le the gas stove for the kitchen. And this is from the uh, deck looking into um, one of the bedrooms. That's got a cork floor. And it's looking out from the deck across the water treatment system quite extensive trenches were needed because of my proximity 
to the creek to ensure that no contaminated water reached the creek. Here are some photographs now of the completed house. This is looking from down the hill. This is taken maybe uh, six months after the house was completed. You can see there the timber end and the rammed earth end of the house. This is the main living room. It's a wonderful, warm, ambient, beautiful room. It really was a pleasure to live in that house. Uh, lovely tiled floor, beautiful rammed earth walls. The timber end of the house was colder in winter, which is something I didn't bargain on. The rammed earth end stayed beautifully warm and the timber end got cold at night in winter. It's the kitchen. It was a lovely, wide, spacious kitchen. Beautiful, beautiful kitchen to utilise. Pantry, which was built out of rammed earth walls, kept everything at a lovely, cool temperature in summer. That's looking out from the kitchen. The outside deck. The uh, clad timber ceiling of the deck. I used a couple of car speakers to be able to play music out there. That's the patio outside the house. A small wood heater, the smallest one I could buy, more than adequate to heat that entire half of the house. In winter it would stay 25 degrees in there by just burning a few pieces of wood an hour. And that's looking down the hill from the rammed earth side of the house. Rammed earth is a magnificent building material. It's expensive, unfortunately but the house will last for a hundred years once the walls are up. The exteriors of the walls obviously are coated with a water repellent coating, which enables them to resist being rained on. They won't deteriorate. It's also good to have wide eaves over rammed earth walls and a very good drainage system around the foundations. The walls are very heavy, so very good foundations are required. Well, I hope you enjoyed looking at uh, my house being constructed. Uh, it was a beautiful house and it is still in existence and you can see it, or the roof of it anyway, looking at Google Earth. Thank you, goodbye.